Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, hard to believe it's April already, but we're, our numbers are thinning up. We still have great attendance for April, about 80 people today. So welcome, everybody, and welcome particularly our new members. Um, I have long contended that we could almost ask anybody in this room to get up and speak. You're all such a fantastic and remarkable group of men and some women, uh, accomplished in many fields. And it would be easy for us to have you come up here, and I'm sure every single man, almost without exception, and woman, could give us uh, their remarkable life um, experiences. But unfortunately, uh, many of you refuse to do that. But, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, we did force Gary Lewis today to get up and talk. Uh, it took us a while, but we finally prevailed. So I'm very happy to introduce him. Um, he grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. Oh, sorry, Alexandria. Uh, Louisiana, and he uh, went on to fly for the Air Force KC-135 refueling tankers out of March Air Force Base. He had several deployments to Vietnam. In fact, he flew 123 combat air refueling missions. He joined American Airlines in 1969 after the Air Force, and uh, also flying KC-997s with the New York National Guard. And from 69 to 2000, as I say, he was with American Airlines flying <coughs> excuse me, MD-80s as a designated check airman. And he also flew the 707, 727, the 757, 767 for 31 years. So he's a, a very experienced man. Uh, he also has type ratings in, <coughs> excuse me, in citations and near jets. He worked uh, for the Palmer's Air Commission for four years after his retirement <coughs> moving down here. And he's been <coughs> a very dedicated member of Old Ball Pilots for 12 years. And he is very dedicated. You guys know him as the guy who takes fifteen dollars off you and lightens your wallet every month. So, come on up, Gary. We're looking forward to hearing you talk. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I'm going to unwire this joint, put that over there. So, hello, everybody. Hey, 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 hey. Gary, you got to sit at the front table. It's amazing. I'm like, whoa, deep, normal, and everything. Uh, Patrick asked me to talk right after the Asiana. 777 uh, crash, and uh, that's an ongoing investigation. And I did not fly that airplane. We will talk a little bit about it at the end of our uh, talk here, my talk. So uh, I threw together some slides, and uh, bear with me. This is kind of a new thing. This is uh, the old, old pilot uh, saying that everybody's familiar with. It's on our website. I uh, grew up in Alexandria, Louisiana. That's home of England Air Force Base, which was the old Alexandria Air Force Base, World War II. Some of you guys, uh, anybody who was based there ever? Flew in. Okay, central part of Alexandria. I was born prior to World War II, and as a little kid, seeing those bombers was really exciting to me. Uh, they were based up there, B-17. And uh, Jack Goodman and his wife took a room from our house. Uh, that's what they did back then. Uh, the, in terms of base housing, you had your wife with you, you took a room in town. And uh, my family, my uh, father was a pharmacist, older guy with two children, so he did not serve in the military, but he took in uh, Jack Goodman and his uh, wife. Most inspirational to me to see these guys, World War II guys, okay? Um, that, that's ingrained in my uh, brain here, in, embedded in my brain. I'm sure everybody's familiar with posters. These guys here, uh, very inspirational to me to be part of this organization. Ken Marks and uh, Blaine, one of the couple of founders of our organization, and also at the Air Museum. And then let's not forget Dick Kelly, uh, Lloyd Humphreys, passed away, World War II guys. So went to Louisiana Tech, ROTC. Um, I grew up in Alexandria, like I said. Had a victory garden in our backyard. My, my uh, sand pile would turn into a foxhole. So I was, uh, I was there, I was ready. All I could think about was Air Force, tunnel vision, flying airplanes. Went to ROTC. Louisiana Tech, that's where I met Shirley, my wife over here. And we, we uh, married several years later, but uh, Louisiana Tech was my home. So uh, I flew T-34 
out of England Air Force Base during ROTC summer camp one day. So that was pretty exciting in, in the uh, early 60s. Uh, grew up uh, high school during the 50s. One of my instructors was a military pilot from World War II, uh, my physics teacher. And uh, he had he formed a uh, uh, aviation club, and we met a couple of times a month, and we took field trips. We actually never flew in an airplane. We talked about flying. When I think about about high school and all my coaches and everything, they were probably all World War II guys. They just didn't talk about it. Not like now. Everybody thought we want to hear the stories. Uh, went to Reese Air Force Base. It was one of the first. Not the first, but one of the one times when all jet training was at one base, the T-37 and the T-38. This is the cockpits. Uh, we actually flew the airplane all the time, no autopilots. Uh, round dials, anybody remember those? Uh, very inspirational to me, graduated there. And, uh, you know, went into KC-135, I'll get more to that shortly, but Everybody's been out to the Air Museum? Yeah. Okay. That was a real inspiration. Everybody talked, here I am, there I was. Uh, this is one from World War II. They actually talked like that. And uh, this picture here, I don't know if you remember this cartoon. This guy, uh, and what you see here is, here's an old colonel who says, uh, there I was hanging on my props. And the two young guys, which was me, Colonel, what's a prop? <laughs> I've been a jet pilot all my life and I've been pilot training, so yeah, what's a prop? So remember those cartoons, anybody? Okay. Uh, one of the things we had in pilot training was a history class, recips, reciprocating engines, radial engines, you know, like what's that, you know? Well, years later, after I got out of the Air Force, I flew KC 135s from New York Air Guard. So I actually had my time flying recips. Uh, we had four turning and two burning. We actually had two jets. Let me get this pointer here. Let's see here. Right there, we actually had two, two jets, on each, one jet on each wing, plus the forward normal. So I got to actually fly history right there. I know most all of you probably like, well, yeah, that's not history to you, but you know, I mean, that's the way it is. History. Yeah. Okay, so uh, during the Cold War, SAC, uh, based at March Air Force Base, also Vietnam. Uh, flew the KC-135. Now this uh, airplane, the PWJ-57, uh, was called the water wagon. We had water augmentation to take off. Uh, 322,500 pounds, pretty heavy airplane to take off. But uh, the J, uh, we had water augmentation. And I don't know if you know what that means, but we actually had a water tanks that we ingested the engines for takeoff to make the, in, the air denser for taking off during the thrust period. Uh, what was weird was, uh, it was first it was asymmetrical, meaning the left side got water from one tank and then the right side got the water from another tank. So if you lost water on one side, you had a real serious yaw problem. They later retrofitted to where one in four and two and three, uh, so that if you lost water, it would be symmetrical. Some shots, uh, I mentioned, I uh, spent a lot of time uh, uh, behind one of those. These are B-52s, so we did uh, support missions for B-52s. We were, during the Cold War, we would sit alert for a week, uh, and uh, we had a, a war mission where you know, and the B-52s were out there on the pad. They were on alert, sitting there with nukes, ready to go. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things, we were just spring-loaded. We were also doing rotations to Vietnam when that started up in the early 60s. So there I am as a co-pilot in the uh, KC-135. And in Vietnam, I flew 123 combat air chief every few missions. The arc light missions were B-52s. We would take off from Guam. I'm sorry, the B-52s would be at Guam. We would be in Okinawa, Kadena. And uh, we would rendezvous uh, just west of the Philippines. 
refuel the fighters on their mission going over to drop their bombs in Vietnam, and there'd be another wave of takers to meet them on the way back. And then they would go back to Guam. So it was a long trip for them. Plane would probably say something like 11, 12 hours, right? 14. 14? 14 hours, think of that. So uh, arc-like missions uh, were very long for the uh, KC-135, that's say four and a half, five hours, something like that. Then the Young Tiger missions, uh, I got some slides about that in just a minute here. Then I served one year <coughs> with SAC on standboard, that's standardization evaluation crew, uh, one year. I was a left seat qualified, but uh, I was in a right seat crew. They wanted a young guy to uh, do the simulators and uh, that way the uh, co-pilots could identify with uh, somebody like me, I guess you'd say. So uh, one thing with the Air Force, it didn't affect your pay as to uh, what position you flew in, so I was okay with that. But I was a Czech Airman, basically a standboard crew there. Let's see here. Okay. What's that? Okay, hold on. Okay, uh, this is a, uh, the refueling tracks for the uh, Young Tiger missions. Uh, this is North Vietnam right here. South Vietnam, there's the name. There was uh, some uh, tan, an tan anchor, and these are called anchors, tan anchor and brown anchor out here over the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, we flew out of Utapao mainly for the fighter support. Different anchors here, so we would get our frag order. Here's a different UDOR and the Squat, uh, different bases up in this area. So we would rendezvous with the fighters and uh, we would be in orbit. We would uh, pass gas to them and they'd go up and do their mission and we'd wait for them to come back. And uh, sometimes actually uh, we had to take four fighters and maybe only three would come back and they'd be doing a rescue mission. So uh, quite often we would go north to uh, join up during the rescue operation. When they're running fighter support, we'd refuel them and they're getting the uh, other types of aircraft in there to recover. So this is Udar, I'm mean, sorry, Udapal on the Gulf of Siam, at the very end of uh, just south of Bangkok, around this way, Cambodia, South Vietnam. Let's see if this thing works here. Okay. Yeah. Can you just hit that right there? Okay, the uh, refueling information, the B-52s, 6,500 pounds per minute. Uh, you can read these here. F-4, 3,400 pounds per minute. That's at uh, 315 knots. Usually around 20,000 feet for a fighter. B-52 is varied uh, based on the uh, uh, mission that they're on. Next slide. Different uh, GWU shots from Vietnam. I took some of these myself, uh, some of them a boom operator, and then I think I do have some slides that took off of the uh, internet. Various ones, I see uh, 105 to bring fuel, and F4 over here, so 105 there. Next slide. A boom operator took this uh, over the Mekong River there. Now the uh, F-105 had the capability of a boom refueling, and they also had uh, a nozzle that would come out that would accept a probe and drogue. Those of you who have seen that airplane at the Air Museum, very fantastic uh, uh, reconstruction of that aircraft, uh, that boom is sticking out. I think they left it there on purpose, so just to show. So that is a dual type. Most of our fighter support, we did this type of probe and drogue, it's called. I'm sorry, boom type versus probe and drogue. So this guy is going up to do his mission. Next slide. And a view, I took this off the internet, a view of uh, coming up to refuel on the KC-135. Boom operator had a window right here. He would uh, lay down, had the control underneath him here, and uh, 
the nozzle that he could extend the boom out, and he would lay down to fly the boom into the position that the fighter pulled into support, okay? On the bottom of the airplane, there are lights that would indicate position that the boom operator would guide the fighter and B-52 into correct position, and then uh, the boom operator would then fly this boom. See right here, this is up right now. It's got two wings on it, and it would move back and forth. Let's see that last slide. That, yeah. Okay, see these are the uh, like wings of the boom. Boom's coming from above. Uh, boom operator is uh, laying down, looking backwards. Okay, next slide, and the next one. Pretty exciting uh, photo. I think I got this off the internet. I don't know. I wasn't, you know, nobody was there that I knew of. So, pretty exciting photo. Okay, the F-104 had a mission in uh, when I was there off the Gulf of Tonkin. They would run. Uh, <coughs> Uh, kind of fighter uh, escort. They would they covered the whole Gulf of Tonkin. When Bob was Bob, where are you? Bob Lally. Okay, he was there earlier. They had a different mission, and this one was uh, off in the Gulf of Tonkin. And the fighters, we had a mission. Uh, the KC 135 had a mission to support them. They were flying a, just a racetrack type of pattern. And Bob told me earlier this morning that that would be very boring for those guys because all they do is just flying around. We had the whole area covered by radar, so we knew if a fighter would pop up, and then maybe they would go ahead and uh, you know take care of the business. But uh, basically, it's the 105. Now this is a probe and drone. You see this? This here. No more. Okay. Oh, everything is gone here. Did I turn this thing off? <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, different light here. Uh, now this this particular type of uh, aircraft only takes a probe and drone. Okay, so you see right here. This is a basket that this has to be hooked on before the KC-135 takes off based on the type of mission that we're flying. So this thing hangs down, the, the boom is up, and this thing hangs down well above the runway, and then it flies out. So then the boom operator will lower it, and then he extends this out. And basically, he holds it in position, and the fighter comes in and hooks up to the basket. So it's very touchy in terms of uh, fighters uh, they are trained to uh, hook in. You can imagine the parallax. You're flying along. Here's this basket, and if you need to turn this, that basket kind of goes in a circle, right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of tricky, but uh, that's the guess. Uh, F-104. Next slide. Now this is kind of a war story that I want to share with you. Um, I was an eyewitness to a historic flight, April 31st and uh, 67. Uh, we had been over there, my squadron had been over there for six months, and we did a couple of different types of rotations. One is they would send one crew at a, a time from each base over for two months. So I had a couple of two-month tours, then and then our whole squadron went over and did a six-month tour. Um, this particular day, I was uh, in down there at the Urupao in, Bank, in south of Bangkok, and we would uh, deadhead up to Kadena, Okinawa, and uh, we were actually in a crew uh, deadheading with another crew deadheading, and the crew that was flying the airplane was, their mission was one last shot, they were going to back to the States, their, their mission was to fly over the Gulf of Tonkin for a couple hours to refuel that F-104, the, the two of them, and uh, they would fly in orbit, and uh, basically just a couple hours and then go on to Kadena, and then they would go to Guam and then back into uh, Hickam and then back to the States of their base. So that was their mission. We were just sitting back there, you know. All of a sudden, we got the word, hey, something's going on. Next slide. Okay, triple refueling. Anybody ever heard of this one? Okay, here's how it happened. They're up there flying F-104, got a call on guard, 
That's Navy common for everybody in the Navy. <laughs> okay. Uh, on guard that they were doing a rescue mission. The Navy tankers, the A3D, didn't have time to go back to their ship, their carrier, to refuel and then uh, go back and help in the rescue. So they needed a tanker at the big time. Now let me say this about uh, back in the day, okay? Air Force and Navy didn't cooperate, you know, like they do today. Uh, we, the Air Force, never refueled Navy. That was like a no-no. Occasionally, when I was at the parts, we would do some training missions. We'd be up, uh, say, over the Mojave, refueling some Air Force fighters from practice. Every once in a while, a Navy guy would say, hey, can you slip me a little? Okay, so, yeah, okay, you know, we would log it and everything. And so that did happen, but, you know, it's not recorded anywhere, and oh, I'm recording this, so you didn't hear this. <laughs> anyway, um, so here we are. They got a call on guard. They need to tank it right now. Okay, this is like a perfect scenario in that they were a lot, they had a lot of fuel because their mission was just to water for a couple hours and then go all the way over to Okinawa. And uh, so they had a lot of fuel. It was a clear day. It was one of those awesome clear days. They got the call. Went down 5,000 feet right over the Gulf, the uh, um, Hanoi, what's the map? Uh, no, the uh, islands there, uh, Hifong Islands, I think it was. Yeah, just. Uh, just off the coast at 5,000 feet. Now, keep in mind, KC-135, you know, you can imagine it could be a target. So, but we had a couple, they had a couple of F-104s uh, as, uh, as covered for them, and they went down too. So, they went down, and uh, as they were refueling a uh, A-3D, now, let me back up a minute. Their, their, uh, their fuel, they could not burn everything, unlike a KC-135. They had fuel that was trapped strictly for offloading. So one of the tankers came in, there was two tankers, only had like 3,000 pounds of fuel. They needed fuel like right now. So they started hooking up. Now here comes uh, A7 uh, A over here, and he was hurt for fuel too. The other tanker was over here refueling already. So this guy here just hooked up. Let's see it right here. He just hooked up to this guy here, and he was already hooked up here. So we were passing the fuel to this guy for him to just to stay airborne, and then they were passing their fuel for refueling to this guy, so triple refueling. Next, uh, next slide. Okay, this is the crew kind of uh, showing what happened. Uh, the, again, another perfect scenario. Uh, Major Castile right here. Uh, Super experienced guy. In fact, the whole crew is super experienced uh, aircraft commander. Um, he had a type rating, which is a civilian rating in the uh, 707 uh, ATP. The uh, co pilot uh, was an Air Force graduate, Air Force Academy graduate, one of the first classes. Uh, he had also a civilian instructor license. Uh, the navigator here. Uh, he had a private license, and the boom operator here, he had a Arkansas driver's license, <laughs> <laughs> but he also had 17 years of experience, a master sergeant. <clears throat> now think of this about the enlisted guys, tankers, tanker, boom operators. Here's a guy enlisted, he has 17 years. How many enlisted guys in any military would have three guys flying a multi-million jet for this guy to get to work? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> so uh, they were super experienced, okay? Next slide. Okay, this I, um, I took this picture myself. Uh, the tanker right here, the A3D, and this is a uh, Navy fighter hooked up. You can barely see the anti dodge right here. So. You know, we were deadhead, so we were all over the airplane. I was back there in the boom compartment. We were on the side, so pretty amazing feat when you think about it. Okay, uh, next slide. So this is some of the ships that uh, they uh, were from, the carriers, the uh, Constellation and the uh, Army Richard. Uh, I'm sure there's some people here who would have some comments about the uh, nickname there. Anybody want to 
enter anything? We have ladies in the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there was a couple of uh, tankers, I mean, um, carriers out there where they were from. <coughs> Aircraft involved, uh, uh, flight staff 2-1 and 2-2, they were the 104s, and they were right with us. The uh, Holly Green Blue and, and Red 2 Navy A3Ds, uh, Page Boy 1 and 2 Navy F8s, and then uh, Taps Room 1 and 2 Navy F4s, all floated 50,000 pounds at uh, about 5,000 feet off of Haiphong Harbor, it just came to me, see a moment here. Uh, Haiphong Harbor, all those islands out there, we can actually see the islands. Now that's pretty far north for a tanker guy, but uh, we did that. and. Uh, at that low an altitude, everybody was burning, we were burning a lot of fuel, but uh, bottom line is we went to bingo fuel, and uh, by the way, radar contact Waterboy and Red Crown, I'm sure some of you flew over there uh, know some of those uh, call signs of the uh, GCIs, uh, uh, Dressing Lady was one of them we worked with a lot. So we wound up going into Da Nang, uh, uh, landing there versus going on to, uh, back to Kadena. And uh, at Da Nang, we all got off the airplane and uh, the dead heading crews, we went into ops. Uh, they happened to be a Marines uh, liaison there. You know, they operate on the other side of the field at Hooches, whereas the Air Force, uh, <laughs> no offense for Marine guys, but you know, you gotta live, right? Okay, so there was a Marine guy there and uh, the uh, crew, Major Castillo was on the phone uh, talking to SAC headquarters probably or somewhere and like, you did what, you know? And uh, so we were there and we were talking to the Marine guy and told him what happened. He got on the horn right away, called out to the uh, fleet out there. And so then the crew <laughs> took off, uh, we all took off to go to Kadena and everybody's saying, oh man, court martial, you know, you don't do this and SAC and everything. But as it turns out, they could short, it's too late now. <laughs> uh, Somebody's laughing over there. Um, they got the Air Force Cross and uh, they won the Mackey Trophy for that year, which is a, uh, a meritorious service, what's it called? Meritorious. Yeah, meritorious service or whatever. Anyway, they won the Mackey Trophy for big time saving people. So it was, it was quite a feat for uh, Air Force. Okay, so this is a couple of pictures of the A3D right here, and that's how they typically refuel Navy F4. And here, see, they use a probe and drogue, and we just happened to have a probe and drogue that day, so that's why the Navy was able to uh, uh, refuel from us. Navy fighters up here, so that's uh, very typical. Uh, took these off the internet, next page. Okay, uh, other tankers. Let's see, Chrome Dome, a uh, couple of times uh, we went up to Alaska. Chrome Dome was, there was a B-52 up there. This is probably not classified anymore. And they were like the first strike. And they would just fly a uh, race car type of pattern around and we would uh, refuel them. Uh, they were loaded with, with uh, the bombs, you know, the nukes. And they would look at Thule, Thule Greenland. And uh, that was like thinking that that was the first, uh, if we were ever attacked, Greenland would be wiped out, Thule Greenland would be wiped off the map right away. So that was like the first indication, and they were ready to go. So we would do some refueling up there. Uh, F-4 deployment, one time our squadron did a uh, deployment of F-4s. They took off from, um, um, uh, I think it's uh, Florida McCord, McCord is it? McDill, McDill, yeah. And uh, they took off, they refueled a couple of times. We picked them up off the coast. Remember, I was at March Air Force Base. And we took them over to uh, Hawaii, landed there, a big party. <laughs> and then uh, the next day, over to Okinawa, I'm sorry, to Guam, <coughs> and another kind of like a party thing. And then the third day, we took them in country, and they dropped off right over South Vietnam. But what was interesting, was because the Air Force had a little different philosophy than the Navy. The Air Force F-4s, both were pilots. So the first leg was flown by the aircraft commanders. And the other guys, the co-pilots, the guys in the back, they were called, were 
flown over to our base, so they were riding with us in the back. Then the next leg to Guam was the back seat guys. They got to fly front seat, and the uh, the aircraft commander then headed with us over to Guam, and then they paired up together to go in country. So, uh, you know, it was pretty exciting. I mean, it was basically clear, and guys were all over the sky. You know, they would do loops and stuff. And but man, any time cloud came in, they were tucked in their little eyeballs looking at us. You know, like whoa, man. And so that was a kind of a neat deployment. Uh, the Nang Mercy Landing. One time, I went into the Nang. Uh, we had a, a cracked windshield, and we were flying over the Gulf of Tonkin, that uh, mission over there, and cracked windshield, so we emergency landed into the Nang, <coughs> which, uh, you know, that was like real combat. And there we were, you know, we were just uh, had our our green bags on, you know, and no overnight stuff, so they kept us there for a couple of days where they flew in a uh, new windshield, and uh, got to run into a good friend of mine from pilot training, uh, John Bush, which uh, I'm wearing his, uh, remember, remember this, the POWMI bracelet? A couple months later he was shot down and uh, never recovered, but I did get a chance to talk with him a little bit, and he was on the F-4, and that was back when uh, they had uh, F-4s flying in the back seat, and the drill was they had 500 missions in the back seat, then they would rotate back over to the front seat, so that was kind of a, kind of a downer for me when he got shot down. Uh, generals in combat, uh, pretty interesting. Being uh, on stand board, uh, we did fly some generals over, and very curious. They actually uh, flew at the end of one month to the first of the next month. Very interesting how that worked out. <laughs> you know, that combat pay, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it was, it was, you know we flew in the uh, Hickam there big party over there, the general staff and everything, and then the next day over to Guam, and then uh, we fly into Okinawa, we go over across uh, South Vietnam at the end of one month, stay over, and then the next day we come back over, so two months of combat pay. Hey, it's all about the money, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, general combat, so uh, B-52, last call. One day, uh, sitting there at Tadena, um, the B-52s had a typhoon over there at Guam, so they all recovered into Kadena. It was really a busy place, you can imagine. I mean, there were airplanes everywhere. B-52s were there, trying to do some missions out there. So one day in the, in the old club, over the PA says, uh, okay, B-52 crews, uh, report to crew rest quarters, uh, you brief at 0630. Okay, so people started leaving now. Then, about 30 minutes later, okay, F-105 pilots, last call for drinks, we'll launch in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, what can you say? You know? <laughs> okay, uh, American Airlines, 1969, retired in the year 2000. Uh, I did fly the, uh, the uh, 767, uh, next slide. Uh, in 1970, uh, I don't know if you remember, in September of 70, there was a big hijacking. They took a bunch of airplanes, put them in the desert in, uh, uh, out of uh, Lebanon. And uh, Nixon decreed there'd be armed guards on board. They were starting up the uh, Sky Marshal program. So I was selected to be a Sky Marshal. And uh, I was also flying in the Air National Guard. Remember, I flew that KC-97. So I was flying airplanes, and I was an engineer flight engineer for America, so okay, I'll go do the Sky Marshal thing. So I did that, and uh, you know, this is my equipment that I carried. I was assigned to Pan Am, next slide. I flew all, all over the world with them a uh, couple of years, and uh, you know, we would take their flight one and flight two, which is their round the world flights, and we go over to, uh, uh, let's see, uh, London then maybe over to Paris, and then uh, into uh, Beirut. Laid over there in Beirut many times, and then uh, they had a flight one and two, which would go either to, Oka, uh, to uh, uh, New Delhi or Karachi, based on the uh, day, every other day. So maybe send two days in Karachi, which is really a hot spot, you know, 
patent in place. Anyway, uh, so we were flying around the world, and basically we were just plain clothes, and uh, my cover story was that I was an airline pilot on vacation. You know? One incident that I'll relate to you, one time I was sitting in the 707 first class. We had, usually 707, they had two guys, one in the back, one in the front, so we rotated. 747, we had uh, three guys, two in the first class. So, uh, I don't remember what the incident was, but there was a passenger that kind of got a little ticked off at the flight attendant and was up in her face, you know, so I acted like any other gentleman. Hey, buddy, sit down, you know. I mean, I didn't make, pull out my gun or anything, you know, I just said, okay. And, and what happened was a couple other businessmen uh, jumped up and they said, yeah, you know, mind your own business. So she, he sat down and left her alone. So that was one of those kind of a, the little stories. I didn't really have to do anything really heroic at all. Thank goodness, you know, we're using the heavy equipment. So I did that for two years and I came back with American. And flew, uh, that's an earlier uh, version of the 727 and the shorty, next slide. Okay, they started the crew resource management at CRM uh, at American in the 1980s. It was open communication. Everybody speaks out, don't keep any secrets. Uh, no, uh, no dominant personality. In other words, uh, there were some captains who, by God, I'm the captain, you know how that goes, okay. Uh, so we want everybody to kind of like, everybody get along. Got a mission to do, let's do it. Mission comes first. So basic to all flying was uh, aviate, navigate, and communicate, and situational situational awareness is very important. You got to know this is like basic to all flying, right? You know, you want to know what you're doing and stay ahead of the airplane. So I flew uh, the MD80 for a couple of years, and uh, next slide. Then next slide, this is different shots of the MD80. And then uh, when the 767 came out to uh, American Airlines, the first time I was based out of LA at the time, I was really excited about that airplane. I mean, I did my homework on it before it came to the base. I was really like gung ho, you know, all this magic stuff, computers and everything else. Like, whoa, this is this is the ultimate. And notice down here, it's not a misspell, that's boring, not boring. <laughs> okay, so I flew uh, domestic for a while, and then uh, I was uh, I was also checked out in the left seat. Flew international out of Chicago to Europe, go to Paris. Now, that sounds really cool. I think going to Paris way over. Oh man, 24 hours, time zone issues, all that stuff. I know everybody who flew has been there and know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I did that for a while. Next slide. But. No round out, man. Everybody know what that is? <laughs> Remember that from the old days, guys? Okay. Uh, and new was flat panel display with lift, lift vectors, a horizontal line, uh, pitch ladder bars, all those new technology stuff, you know, but none of this round dial stuff. So, uh, next slide. Okay. Now, what happened is uh, here's some different levels of animation, uh, automation. Uh, manual hand flying, okay, you're actually flying the controls, you know. Uh, you might have a cable going out to fuel, fuel control. Um, autopilot on, basic altitude hold, heading hold, then the flight guidance panel, uh, control, autopilot, auto, it controls the autopilot and all the throttles that controls the airplane. Then the flight management computer comes along and uh, controls automatic systems that controls the airplane. So. You're getting further and further away as a pilot from the airplane, okay? Next slide. So there's a real paradox here. The purpose is to reduce workload, okay? Uh, how many times has guys said to, to themselves, or, you know, me as a Czech airman, now the MD-80 was basic, but it did have a flight guidance system that uh, evolved. And so how many times have I heard this, what's it doing now, okay? <laughs> You become task, task saturated. I mean, I have told new, new pilots and co pilots or captains if you get behind the airplane, it's just an airplane. You got a white button and a yellow button. One's an autopilot, one's auto throttle. Just kick it off, just hand flop. There's the airplane, there's the airport over there, just go over there and land. And they would say, 
can I do that? You know, <laughs> no. You know, I mean, you know, because in the simulator, they're so schooled to uh, get the computer working. And to be the pilot, not a manager. Okay, next slide. So I was a Czech Airman from 1988 to 2000. So uh, let me say this about airline flying. You know, bottom line is uh, all about money. Airline people. Okay, you go to the bigger airplane, longer trips over water pays more. Me as a Czech Airman. As if I was flying all that, but I was flying an MD-80 Czech Airman. I was hand flying it for three, two, three, four legs a day. Yeah, I had a new guy in the right seat or a left seat, but I was actually flying airplanes, and that's what I wanted to do. You know, uh, talking to my contemporaries at the time, one of their attitudes is, uh, "You're exposing yourself too much." <laughs> I don't mean exposing, but I mean, you know. <laughs> You're putting yourself out there in harm's way, I mean, you know, landings and, and with a new guy and all that stuff, but me as a pilot, I didn't have a problem with that. That's what I signed, signed on for, you know? And I got a personal reward out of helping new guys, especially new co pilots watching them blossom out. I know probably several of you are instructors or have been instructors, so you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a, it's a personal feeling, and bottom line, it didn't affect my pay, so. I thought it was a good deal. I was offered a chance to go to uh, a bigger airplane, but I like to take off landing. I like the domestic operation. We did fly down to Mexico. And uh, uh, flying domestically, the time zone change was critical. And I wasn't trying to impress anybody with the one going to Paris, you know, so this is my personal feeling. Next slide. So uh, I had more takeoff and landing. Next slide. Nine check airman stories, uh, what's it doing now? We already talked about that. I've already talked about, you know what I mean? Uh, it's one of those things that uh, if you get behind the airplane, uh, just hand fly. What's it doing now? No, be the pilot, kick it off. Be the pilot. Don't try to impress me. I've had some students, you know, I'm a check airman. They were trying to show me what they do. They could be, the, be behind the airplane. And that's one of those things that, you know, I'm just another pilot here. I want you to just perform, even though you know I'm checking them out and everything else. And typically on the MD-80 at an American, we would fly a minimum of 25 hours on the line. And by the way, for those who are not familiar with airline flying, the first time a new guy flies the airplane for real is with a Czech airman. Simulator is so good, they get the type rating and everything in the simulator. So now they're out on the line with real people, oh my gosh. And some of them were kind of like, oh man, you know, but uh, uh, part of my job as Czech Airmen is to calm them down, uh, let them have a, quite a bit of leeway. So we talked about CRM, and a couple times, uh, uh, like I got the airplane, that one there, yeah, a couple times I did have to take the airplane because I let them go so far, I had a little more tolerance in terms of my uh, uh, slack to let them figure out what's going on, you know, so if they got a little behind the airplane, then I would maybe take it over, get it straight, and then let them take try it again. Uh, sometimes I did have to send some people back to more training, and a few times uh, a couple of guys uh, just would not sign off, and pretty much it was up to the chief pilot, which is over there in the flight academy in there in the DFW. Next slide. Uh, and I miss uh, flying, but I don't miss this. <laughs> you know, that, that's part of it. Next slide. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a de-icing operation at uh, LaGuardia. And the next slide. So this was, uh, I saved this page. And uh, uh, this was the day, let's see, I don't see the date, can't read the date on this one. But, maybe. Anyway, this was gone forever. They used to, in you know, O'Hare, this is O'Hare, um, they used to name all the runways kind of neat there, like New Scenic, Old Scenic, uh, the Air Force Scenic, the uh, Hangar Alley uh, East, Hangar Alley West, the Bypass, uh, the Branch, you know, on and on. So they, they changed all those to real 
uh, international ITO designations where they had numbers and everything for all these. So I'll say that. I know several of you flew into uh, there and probably remember those designations, right? Okay, next slide. So I never been to an airplane and I never heard anybody. Took this off the internet, so <coughs> I was ready. You know, it's one of the things that you always do is you're always ready for yes, you're going to take off. Yes, your thinking is abort. Once you start going, okay, I'm going to land. Where are you going to land? That's one of those thinkings that even the private pilots who are just learning how to fly, that's one of those things that the good instructor will, will get them into their thinking. Okay, next slide. My last retirement flight, uh, the, uh, out there at the Bois, at LAX, uh, the uh, fire department met me with a uh, spray, very uh, moving, emotional. Next slide. Okay, uh, this is my, my son up here. He got to fly on my land. It was a three day trip. And my son in law, they came on one leg. And it was a three day thing. Next slide. And Shirley got to fly with me all three days. Uh, it was really a great trip. And uh, she shared some of the experiences I had uh, in the cockpit. Next slide. <coughs> okay, uh, the flight attendants, um, they had they bought a little book, it was a thing on golf, kind of a joke book. They passed it around to all the crew, all the passengers to sign, and, you know, thanking me and all that stuff. So, I don't know if you can read this. Right here it says, I was going to hijack the airplane until I heard it was your last day. Congratulations to the terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> <Now>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't get that until I got on the ground. <laughs> and, and, and I was a Czech airman and, uh, you know, a sky marshal, like, whoa, I should have landed in Phoenix or something, but, you know, one of those things, I still have that. I made that very funny. That was like, whoa, you know. That was in 2000 before 11, you know. Okay, next, next slide. So that's my, uh, one of my glory flights, last flights. Next slide. And uh, after I retired, I served on the airport commission for four years. That's the old tower. I was uh, uh, kind of uh, one of the guys that really, in the commission, really promoted the new tower. So Larry was there with me. Larry, where are you? Over here, okay. He was uh, served on it also, remembers those days. Next slide. Okay. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Patrick asked me after the 777 of Asiana, that's the uh, Asiana right there, oops. Okay, I want to bring up Barry Steiner. Barry, come on up. Uh, Barry uh, is, was a Navy pilot in 1968 to 77. Uh, flew for Delta for 29 years. Uh, last seven years, has been a Boeing uh, contract uh, on a 777 and 787. He's currently teaching in Shanghai. So he is probably jet lagged, got back day before yesterday, Monday. Monday. So why don't you, uh, uh, I did not fly the 777, so he is very familiar with it. And because it is an ongoing uh, investigation, he's going to talk mainly about the difference in the, uh, the uh, auto throttle. So turn it over to Barry for a moment. <coughs> Can you hear me, Barry? Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Another beautiful day in the desert, isn't it? I was in Shanghai for the last six weeks, and I was really missing the desert weather. I didn't tell you that. I was eating my heart out. It was, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, you folks have been to uh, China lately, but the air quality in Shanghai leaves a little bit to be desired. Even on a sunny day, it's a gray day in Shanghai, so I'm really glad to be back home in the desert. I miss it a lot. Uh, first of all, uh, Gary asked me to talk a little, about, a little bit about the 777 and uh, with a view to what happened uh, here uh, last July in San Francisco. Well, just as a general disclaimer, in case there's anybody from the media in the room, uh, I, am, I am by no means a spokesman for the Boeing company here today. I am a uh, flight instructor uh, and I work as a contractor for, for Boeing. 
Uh, so there is a lot of plausible deniability that uh, Boeing can use to say that I do not work for them, so that I do not represent them. But I, I can talk to you a little bit about the 777 uh, and uh, the uh, training program that we deliver to uh, the Boeing customers. Uh, some uh, has has everybody in the room any uh, everybody in the room flown on the 777 before? Just a, for, for my benefit, it'll show my hands of how many people have actually flown on a 777. It's a great airplane. It's a great airplane to, to travel in and as a passenger, and it's a fantastic airplane to fly as a pilot. Uh, it's a real solid machine, and I really enjoy working with it. Uh, just a couple of fun facts about the airplane uh, to kind of give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. <coughs> I like to call it the heavy twin. I know we have a lot of light twin drivers in the room. This is the heavy twin. Uh, just a, as an example, the uh, the aircraft is 209 feet long. It's a little bit smaller than a 747, and uh, quite a bit larger than a 767. It fits right in the marketplace, right between those two airplanes. Uh, it's got a 200 foot wingspan. It'd be kind of hard to fit one of them in a football field. And the tail of the aircraft is 60 feet high. That's like a six-story building. It, it doesn't look that big when you look out the terminal window, but when you get up close to it, it's a pretty impressive-sized airplane. Uh, let's see, last time I went to Costco, I filled up my tank, and I was kind of shocked at how much it cost me, but uh, 777 carries 45,000 gallons of fuel on board. So you can imagine what, what that, uh, I wonder if you get frequent flyer points with that when you get us up. Uh, Gary mentioned about the size of the KC-135. Uh, uh, the uh, 777 uh, 200 uh, ER model that AGM operates uh, carries uh, 300,000 pounds of fuel, which is pretty impressive. 300,000 pounds of gas, and it uh, grosses out for takeoff at 650,000 pounds. It's a solid airplane, and it's uh, pretty cool. The engines, uh, they, they come in different variants, uh, different customers get different engines depending on what kind of fuel they can work out with the engine manufacturers. So when we teach 777, we can teach either uh, GE engines uh, or Pratt Whitney engines or Rolls Royce engines. And just as a little uh, factoid, uh, the engine thrust put up with these uh, various different engines ranges from 75,000 pounds to 115,000 pounds per engine of thrust. Pretty powerful motors. In fact, uh, next time you go to the airport, you look at one of these 777s, if you go through LAX or someplace where they fly, uh, the engine size has the same caliber of the fuselage of a 737. <laughs> so next time you see a 737, look around, that's what it's like being inside the engine of a, engine of a 777 airplane. Uh, it, incidentally, uh, when, I, when I teach the airplane, and, uh, and my friend Joe Ryan sitting over the table here is the fellow instructor of Boeing with me. In fact, he, had, he helped me get the job at Boeing uh, six, uh, six and a half years ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, when we teach uh, the procedures for the airplane, uh, we have a flight control check, and the pilots, they want to they grab the wheel, they turn back and forth, and push the yoke forward and aft. And, and I have to tell them, you know, when you push that yoke forward and aft, that horizontal stabilizer in the aft end of the airplane is the size of the wing on a 737. So be nice and gentle when you move that around, otherwise actually the airplane will go up and down on the ground while you're testing the, the flight controls. It's kind of interesting. Now, uh, one of the things that I can, uh, that I can address is the, the training program that Boeing delivers to the customers. And I, and I got my training manuals out and added up some numbers just to give you an example of, of what happens when a pilot goes through transition training on the uh, Boeing 777. Uh, first of all, we put him in a, a classroom in front of a computer, and he sits in front of that computer for 40 hours to learn the systems, uh, all the systems in the airplane, all the academics that are involved that are required by the, uh, the FAA. Uh, so we call it uh, CBTs, uh, computer-based training, uh, and uh, you need to have a large cup of coffee when you sit down <laughs> to perform that computer-based training, believe me. Uh, after they uh, complete, well actually they, they complete the computer-based training while they go through the flight training device. 
A flight train device is a simulated cockpit that's just stationary on the ground. It doesn't move, and it's, uh, in some cases, it's a computer simulation of, of a flight deck. We have uh, it built up like a cockpit. We'll have an overhead screen, that, uh, computer screens that look like the cockpit, and they're all touch, uh, touch operated. Uh, and then uh, now uh, the newer flight training devices actually have control wheels and uh, rudders and uh, uh, a uh, oper operating of uh, um, mode uh, control panel that controls all the auto flight that we have in the aircraft that Gary alluded to. Uh, we do uh, nine sessions, nine two-hour sessions in the uh, in the flight train devices. That's uh, preceded by about a one and a half hour, an hour to an hour and a half brief. We go into the trainer for two hours and practice uh, normal and non-normal procedures. And, uh, and then we have about a half hour debrief afterwards and talk about what we did. Once they get the trainees get through the uh, flight training device, and they will finish their 40 hours of uh, computer-based training in addition to that, and then they graduate to the full flight simulator. Uh, now these full flight simulators are on hydraulic or electric uh, jacks, and it's a full-size cockpit. And uh, once you close the back door and you turn the motion on and turn on the visuals, there's virtually no difference from today's modern simulators in the actual airplane, except that you can't get a meal on <laughs> You can't get any coffee and you can't get meals delivered up to the cockpit, so that's the, only, that's the only difference. Otherwise, the visuals come off of Google, Google Maps and they're very realistic. You can fly visual approaches with these simulators. Uh, that's how good they are. Uh, our trainees go through uh, 40 hours of full flight simulation and during that 40 hours, we practice all the normal procedures, but plus we practice all the non-normal procedures. Uh, and that's the that's Boeing terminology that I had to learn when I went there. We used to call them emergency procedures, but they don't use the emergency word anymore. They just call it non-normal procedures. And that could be uh, engine fire, uh, cabin depressurization, and emergency descent. But we don't even call it emergency descent anymore. We call it a rapid descent. So I guess that's more politically correct. And while, uh, while going through the uh, flight simulation, uh, I took a look to see... Oh, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's... That's working. Okay. Uh, during, during the, uh, the uh, full flight uh, training, uh, the uh, trainees get to uh, execute 38 instrument approaches. That's both uh, ILS plus non-ILS approaches. And uh, they get to do 15 visual approaches. And I know that that's probably an interesting number because uh, what happened to Asian in, in San Francisco uh, was a non-instrument approach. It was just a visual, a visual approach. So in, in the full transition program, they get to, uh, to fly 15 visual approaches in the simulator. They get 38 landings, and they actually get 15 go-around uh, operations, which is a rejected landing or uh, a missed approach on an instrument approach. So they are trained in, in these procedures. It was kind of interesting because uh, the training is pretty comprehensive, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you've heard the expression trying to drink out of a fire hose. When you go through some of these transition programs on the 777, and especially on the 787, which is even more complicated, it's like standing at the base of Niagara Falls with your mouth open and just trying to absorb all the water that comes down off the falls. It's, uh, it's pretty intensive. But so far, I've had a perfect pass rate, so I guess it seems to be working okay. This is my home away from home. Joe probably looks familiar to you, too. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Thanks, I, I wanted to address uh, another thing about the intimidation fact, factor. When the students come, in, come into our training uh, center, uh, they get their uh, the training manuals. Uh, the operating, operating manual for the 777 is over 1,800 pages long. There's a lot of stuff in that manual. 
and we try to boil it down to what they need to know to safely operate the airplane. And then if they choose, they can spend as much time on their own to go through the manuals as they would like. So 1,800 pages for the uh, operating manual. The quick reference guide is another 500 pages, which <laughs> covers all the non-normal procedures that they might run into at, at, at one time or another. Uh, but there is a there is a caveat printed in the uh, in the manuals that, that no amount of uh, of uh, information put out from Boeing uh, can cover any conceivable uh, situation that a pilot might find himself, and it is up to the pilot to use his experience and skill to cope with any uh, unanticipated non-normal situations. And all about the, uh, that we have also have, a, in addition to the uh, operating manual and the quick reference manual, uh, we have another 350-page flight crew training manual that tells them all the particular flying characteristics of the airplane. So uh, you add all that uh, together, and it looks like you get over 2,700 pages of material that they have to absorb in about six weeks. That's how long the program lasts. In fact, we have, that's the full, the full on trans, uh, transition program. We also have a short transition program. Uh, in fact, that's what I just came back from Shanghai on Monday. I delivered a, a, a short transition program to a couple of pilots from Hainan Airlines on the 787, and that runs about four weeks. Gary wanted me to address uh, along the lines of the, he was talking about on the uh, cockpit automation, uh, specifically about the auto throttle system. On the 777, uh, we have uh, four modes of autopilot operation. We have, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a full-time autopilot system. Uh, when we uh, set power for takeoff, we push the uh, TOGA, which is takeoff go-around switches, and that turns on the autopilot. It's a full-time operation, and they remain on until 25 feet off the ground on approach. Uh, the auto throttles retard to idle and disconnect when you activate the reverses on landing. So it is a full-time autopilot, uh, auto throttle operation, which I think, uh, I enjoy having auto throttles because it really reduces the workload. Now I grew up on the 727, which is kind of steam-driven Studebaker kind of an airplane, where we had just uh, no automation whatsoever. We had an autopilot that would fly straight and level and you could do turns with it. And, and basically that's about all we did, and I spent a lot of years doing that. And then I graduated uh, to the uh, 767 uh, that Gary mentioned, and uh, wow, that was a big change in philosophy of operating an airplane. Because I had a thing called a flight management computer, which was, which was a total mystery to me at the time, and it took years to master that thing. Uh, but uh, it, in fact, uh, Here's the control panel for the flight managed computer. This is for the first officer. This is the captain. They're identical, and they can both do. They can both do whatever you need to do to tell the airplane automation system how to operate. This. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, this is the uh, uh, mode control panel that I mentioned earlier. It sits right in front of the pilots uh, on the glare shield, and uh, the uh, system is broken down. Uh, the auto throttle system is over here. We have uh, uh, roll modes and pitch modes here for vertical speed and uh, flight, level uh, flight level change. We set an altitude in the window here. Push the flight level change switch here and the airplane climbs to the altitude that's selected in the window. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is the auto throttles. And we have two little switches here that are auto throttle arm switches. That turns the auto throttle system on and off and we have various modes that we can uh, set climb power, continuous power, flight level change, and we have a thing called vertical navigation that operates off of this switch right here. On the uh, throttles, uh, the thrust levers, we used to call them throttles, now they're called thrust levers. Uh, there are little buttons on the sides, sides of the switches. In fact, you can't see them too well in the picture, but right here on the sides of the throttle, on the thrust levers, you see these little buttons. And those actually can dis disengage the auto throttle system. It deactivates the servos. So basically, they don't work unless you 
change the mode of on the on the uh, the mode control panel, change the mode, and then they kick into action again. Now you've heard a lot in the media about auto throttle wake up. That was it became pretty. Uh, a uh, pretty, pretty popular term after the Asiana problem. They said, the auto, well, the auto throttle's gonna wake up and that's why we crashed. Well, <laughs> you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a pilot. You've got, you've got thrust levers that operate the engines and you can operate them. The, uh, all, the, all the automation that Gary talked about earlier is to make the pilot's job easier. Because a lot of these flights are long and tiring and uh, the, uh, the flights uh, can range. I've had a, a flights uh, going to work that are 16 hours long, and you can imagine after 16 hours in an airplane, you kind of worn out. So it's nice to have this automation working for you. Uh, however, it's, it's incumbent upon the pilot to make the airplane do what he has to make it do to operate the aircraft safely. Uh, we demonstrate to our, our trainees in the training program uh, some of the uh, stall protection uh, facilities that Boeing has integrated in, in, into the airplane. And one of the examples that we demonstrate on the very first full flight uh, simulator operation is uh, we put them in cruise altitude and we, uh, we disengage the auto throttles by uh, turning off those little uh, buttons that are on the side of the thrust levers. And we just watch the speed wind down until it gets down uh, near minimum speed, just above stick shake or stall speed. And then when the speed gets down near the, near the, the stick shake, shake or speed, the auto throttles just activate and they come, uh, they, they, they turn themselves on and they apply thrust to keep the airplane above the uh, stick shake or speed. And that's what the auto throttle wake up does. Uh, we also do another example where we turn off the uh, the arm switches on the remote control panel here, which totally turns off the system and then it uh, disenables the auto throttle wake up. And we pull the power off on the autopilot and cruise. And the autopilot's smart enough that it realizes there's not enough speed to fly with. So the autopilot actually has the airplane start a descent to keep it in flying speed until the pilot does something to correct the situation. So that's a, those are the, uh, the stall protection devices that are put under the airplane. Uh, what we had with uh, Asiana, and I can't really address what happened to them because I wasn't there and I haven't read the, uh, I haven't seen the uh, transcript from, from the uh, voice recorder and I haven't read the NTSB report. Uh, but they, they seem to have got themselves into a, to a situation uh, that nobody had ever seen before where they were low and slow and they were in a regi regime where the auto throttle wake up system was inactive and that's what happened to them and i'm getting the uh, the wind up sign here from gary so i think i'll uh, i'll just give it back to, to him okay very good Thank thanks you. folks thanks for your time. Thank you very much for... Yay!